So, today our topic is understanding creation. What are the moral implications of Darwinism? Uh, understanding Creation is a book that's uh, just recently been published by the Pacific Press Publishing Association and available at the uh, various Adventist uh, book centers. And uh, it's edited by James Gibson of the uh, Geoscience Research Institute and Umberto Rossi, who is for a long time uh, Education Secretary for the General Conference. There are 20 chapters which are arranged as questions, and they're intended to be read as standalone, although obviously they have some overlap and will occasionally refer to each other. Um, the original proposal was for 1,800 uh, to 2,400 words. I think that uh, some chapters are a little bit longer than that. Most of them are, uh, uh, fall within that range. <coughs> and this week, uh, we're going to be talking about what are the moral implications of Darwinism. And it's written by a good friend of mine, Earl Agard. Uh, Earl uh, completed his BA at Pacific Union College and served with his wife as a student missionary at Colegio Adventista de Bolivia. He uh, then obtained a master's degree in, at uh, PUC and did further the graduate work at Colorado State. Um, did some research at uh, the Andes of Venezuela and got his PhD degree. And then he taught in secondary school for four years and then began to teach at PUC and taught there for about 22 years. Uh, then moved down to Southern Adventist University for a while and then he retired. And he's continuing to write and lecture and uh, uh, participate in seminars in faith and science around the world, including uh, one this last year that I saw him at. Um, to just give you kind of an overview of the, what we're going to be looking at, he outlines the theoretical implications uh, and the practical results of ethics that are based on Darwinism and naturalism. Um, he documents the fact that Darwinists are well aware of these implications and, in fact, push for their acceptance. And he notes that Christians and even Adventists are not immune to this influence if they're not prepared to argue with the uh, premises to begin with. Earl Eggard starts out, <clears throat> every society or culture has a story that explains the origin of human beings. The story forms the foundation for the group's laws and morality. And mor by morality, he means uh, standards of conduct that distinguish right from wrong. Uh, Western civilization arose among people who believed the universe was a special creation of a loving God who superintended his creation within a framework of natural laws that we in time could discover and use to improve our lives. If mankind is crea creation's crown, which is taught in Genesis, then human life should be regarded as sacred. In denying a creator, Darwinism proposes a complete change in the definition and application of morality. Instead of, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, this naturalistic origins myth, and what he means by an origins myth is a term referring to any story of origins that involves prehistoric supernatural activity. Uh, myth can be true or false. It just can't be verified empirically. It begins with something like, in the beginning were the particles. That's a quotation from Johnson, uh, who's a critic, but it's a pretty good summary. Actually, in the beginning they don't know what, um, because there were the particles and then before that there was uh, something that uh, came out of nothing, I guess. But uh, it was brought, uh, uh, this alternative was first proposed by the ancient Greeks, and uh, he cites Lucretius, uh, but was brought to prominence in modern times by Charles Darwin. This perspective has become entrenched among the intellectual elites in most, much of the world. Despite very real changes in law and morality that occur once the Darwinist worldview gains acceptance in a given society, Little thought has been given to the consequences of the shift from a theistic to an atheistic moral foundation. In this chapter that he's writing, he says, we will look at several issues. One, the tenets of Darwinism that impact morality. 
two, the logical outgrowth of adopting those tenets as a basis for law and culture, and three, examples showing the real-world consequences for each of us. Um, first, Darwinism and human nature. Darwinism proposes that life on Earth is the result of an unguided process involving the random interactions of non-living chemicals on the early Earth, of course, sorted by a non-random process. Um, once the first living cells formed and its genetic systems were in place, random changes in the DNA code gradually built new and different forms. After hundreds of millions of years, hominids emerged in Africa. These early pre-humans gradually became modern human beings via random DNA mutations selected by the environment over thousands of generations. As George Gaylord Simpson put it, and he uh, gives the reference, man is the result of a purposeless and natural process that did not have him in mind. And that's a pretty good summary of the, the uh, teaching of Darwinism. The most important claim of Darwinism is that the apparent design of living things, from the intricacies of our cellular machinery to the complex organs and tightly integrated organ systems of complex organisms, can be described as a result of a mindless, undirected, and completely natural process. No designer, and certainly no god, was necessary. Everything about the living world, from the operations of our bodies and brains to the religious and moral lives that we live, is explained by reference to energy, matter, physical law, and time. And again, he cites somebody who argues precisely that way, Richard Dawkins. The implications of this kind of uh, uh, belief in uh, how humans came to be for morality. Instead of viewing humans as created in God's image, Darwinism sees them as simply an extension and elaboration of certain animals, distinctive only in features and abilities. Logically, if man is not essentially different, then he should not be treated as if he were. That is, under the Darwinian view, a worldview, laws that privilege human beings in comparison to other members of the animal kingdom are illogical. The animal rights movement, which coalesced with the publication of Animal Liberation, which uh, uh, Peter Singer was the author of, is a clear result of this perspective. Peter Singer achieved fame, or perhaps notoriety, by seriously suggesting that we should act on Darwin's insights, that we should not always prefer human beings simply because they are human, and that in some cases certain animals have a stronger claim to life than certain humans. <clears throat> Although Christians have long opposed cruelty to animals, they have not regarded animals as equal to humans, basing their view on texts such as Exodus 20.10, Proverbs 12.10, and Luke 12.6-7. Um, uh, uh, God pays attention to sparrows, but you are much more value than many sparrows. So uh, humans ha uh, animals have value, but not as much as humans. However, animal rights act activists have moved well beyond the animal welfare efforts of the last century. And some assert that at times it is morally preferable to use human beings rather than chimpanzees for medical research. In the minds of these activists, our laws should stop favoring members of Homo sapiens over non-human species simply because they are humans, just as we attempt to stop the favoring of males over females and of one race over another. A new and different set of criteria must be developed to determine with moral what moral decisions should be made. Created from animals, perhaps the most comprehensive attempt to work out how our society should be re reordered according to a Darwinist reality was published by the late James Rachels, formerly a philosophy professor at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. His book, created from animals, attempts to work out Darwinism's moral implications. It is a relentlessly logical explanation of where naturalistic thinking leads. And if one grants Professor Rachel's his premises, it becomes very difficult to argue with his major conclusion, that the proper view for a Darwinian is the ethic he calls moral individualism. 
And of course, he has a reference for that. Since man is not a special creation made in God's image, but the result of an unguided gradual process of evolution by natural selection over millennia, we are not different in kind from the non-human animal world, according to Rachel's. Thus, treating human beings simply because they are human beings differently than we do animals is, in his terms, speciesist. To parallel racist or sexist. In other words, we express an unjustified bias that grants our species privileges that we refuse to other species. The basic idea of moral individualism, as proposed by Rachel's, is that how, quote, how an individual may be treated is to be determined not by considering his group memberships, but by considering his own particular characteristics. End quote. <coughs> Professor Rachel's expected that this view would result in an improvement of the treatment of animals through widening the circle of moral obligations, which traditionally was applied to human beings. The broader circle would include animals, mammals showing evidence of higher brain function, for example, great apes, dolphins, and elephants. I don't know if you've ever seen an elephant draw a picture. It is striking. Of course, if higher brain function is to be the measure of one's moral status, then humans judged the lack, uh, judged to lack the requisite brain function can be treated as if they were lower animals, which also lack such function. This logical yardstick legitimates the abortion of unborn humans, infanticide of very young children, euthanasia of the elderly and disabled, the creation of human embryos for destructive experimentation, and many other activities that we have traditionally categorized as unacceptable and thus criminal. Rachel's is careful to reassure his readers that, quote, human life can still be valued and we can still justify moral and legal rules to protect it. We will, however, have to acknowledge that the, these rules grow out of our own valuings rather than descending to us from some higher authority. If that is a loss, it may be a loss that humans after Darwin must live with. Or die with, of course, since the ethic that Rachel espouses imperils many of our fellow human beings who have long been protected by our espousal of the sacredness of human life. If society deems humans no more special than any other species, the burden of those disabled and thus useless or expens or, and are expensive does not have to be borne. They can be mercifully done away without raising any moral qualms. Some will say this, is an ext this extreme outcome merely represents the cogitations of an academic philosopher with no real-world application. Those tempted by the comfort of such thoughts would do well to read the current literature in bioethics in general. Even some Christian bioethics have become converts to this Darwinist view. James Walters in Is Coco a Person? And he gives the reference, argues that a person's unique moral claim to life depends primarily on his or her mental capacities. The individual being who will never possess or is forever beyond the possession of neocortical functioning does not have a special moral claim to life. This Christian professor expresses agreement with Peter Singer that handicapped babies, disabled adults, and others may be killed under some circumstances. Among bioethicists, this position isn't shocking, but it is certainly a long way from the traditional Christian concept of the sacredness of human life. And now we apply Darwinism. So what are the practical moral implications of Darwinism? Rather than speculate, we can look for evidence of how human beings are to be treated in nations that have moved from a commitment to the laws of nature and nature's God, which is, of course, quote from the uh, American Decla Declaration of Independence, to an embrace of the Darwinian Dar view of the origin of life in mankind. Perhaps the easiest way to access trustworthy information, both about what is actually occurring and about what is being discussed, is to search the internet u using the term Darwinian bioethics. Recent items include the following, and he gives a, a reference to some of the collected stuff. The Scottish Parliament's bill to allow active euthanasia by 
non-medical people with no limitations on health status, age, or method of dealing death. So I kill you, I claim that you asked for it, whatever, and it doesn't matter whether I'm a doctor or not. Of course, in one sense, I would agree that it doesn't matter whether I'm a doctor or not, but I would use the precise reverse. Efforts by Compassion and Choices, an assisted suicide advocacy group, to eliminate the conscience exception to laws legalizing abortion, euthanasia, and other lethal medical care, meaning that those who are unable to conscientiously kill a patient who wishes to die would be forced to either violate their conscience or quit medical practice. The refusal to provide a new and highly effective, life-changing, in the words uh, <coughs> that are describing this drug, to British sufferers from rheumatoid arthritis by NICE, the uh, UK's National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellent, Excellence. And he adds in parenthesis, it appears that nobody in the British government has read C.S. Lewis's That Hideous Strength, which uh, if you've read it, you realize that there's a... Uh, there's another outfit that's called nice that is, um, uh, shall we say, it turns out not to be nice. Examples such as these starkly illustrate the trajectory of the course taken when biblical principles are abandoned in favor of relativistic concepts that judge some human lives as valuable and therefore legally protected, but others less valuable and th thus not protected. This is the logical entailment of a Darwinist view. William Provine, Cornell University professor in biological sciences, provides perhaps the most straightforward declaration about what Darwinism entails in regard to faith. Religion is compatible with modern evolutionary biology and indeed all of modern science. And I think there's an only, although he quotes it only with the if. If the religion is effectively indistinguishable from atheism. And uh, again, he gives the reference. The news is not unremittingly bad. One bright spot is Team Hoyt, a story published in Sports Illustrated. Interestingly, no longer found on their website, but posted on YouTube. And he gives the, the reference in YouTube. Rick Hoyt was born severely disabled by cerebral palsy, and his parents were urged to, quote, put him in an institution, end quote, because he would never walk, talk, or be anything but a vegetable. The family took him home and treated him like their two other boys. Over the years, Rick learned to communicate with the help of a computer, attended school, graduated from college, saved his father's life, and became a potent symbol of the value of every human being, regardless of, quote, usefulness, end quote, or disabilities. However, this type of story is considerably harder to find than the other kind. The trajectory of modern culture is illuminated by the outcry against former Alaska Governor Sarah Palin's decision to give birth to her child after learning that he had Down syndrome. Ergard uh, concludes, <clears throat> we no longer need to guess where we will end up if we decide to continue progressing away from our theistic roots. Several countries in Europe are further along the path than many, most notably Switzerland with its euthanasia tourism and the Netherlands with its doctors euthanizing patients of all ages. Those who wonder about what is really happening in specific cases and countries should seek out information on their own rather than trust popular media for objective reporting. Popular media simply go quiet on this most of the time. It is a logical certainty that in the absence of a standard outside of ourselves and without a renewed acceptance of the concept of human exceptionalism, what will rule is our human nature, whether it is the result of our sinful condition or of, million years of millions of years of natural selection. Humans are naturally selfish. We are most interested in our own well-being and that of our relatives. If we design laws according to our inclination, we will see to it that our own group is taken care of. The others, not so much. In fact, when we perceive that our own well-being may be advanced by damaging someone else, we are likely to do the other person damage. 
This can be seen in the high incidence of abortion, and he notes that about 90% of Down's babies are aborted. Um, what's perhaps most interesting is that in India, some 98% of the aborted fetuses are female. And in the ethic, ethnic and religious violence experienced in such places as Rwanda, Bosnia, Sudan, and on and on. The Christian standard of morality requires all to love your neighbor as yourself. And of course, that's both in Leviticus and in Matthew. Despite constant failures in meeting this moral obligation, it has nevertheless encouraged protection of the poor, weak, and disabled much better than any system man has devised. When we adopt Darwinism as our origins myth, we abandon this transcendent standard. Without it, morality devolves to some form of might makes right. Those with more power rule and variously oppress those with less. The 20th century has provided us with at least three major cautionary examples in Soviet Russia, Nazi Germany, and Mao's China. The 21st continues the lesson we are so slow to absorb. We must pay closer attention and learn. Now, my take on the chapter, uh, I think the subject is an important one. I agree with Earl and with those Darwinists he quotes on the implications of Darwinism. I think they've got it right. Um, I think Earl has really done a great job in almost entirely avoiding Godwin's law, even though the subject fits. I mean, you, you know, uh, Nazi Germany had this concept that the strong survive the weak should be uh, gotten rid of. And because of that history in German society, they still don't like to use the word euthanasia because of the bad experience that Germany went through. Uh, of course, if he had led with that, it would sound like the whole uh, chapter is an argument ad Hitlerum, which is uh, uh, when it is true is an effective argument, but it also biases some people because, oh, you're just blaming everything on Hitler. Uh, as Stalin and, uh, uh, might add, Pol Pot and uh, Mao show, it's not just Hitler. Pol Pot was left out of the list, but certainly belongs there. Uh, to be fair, religions that do not have the golden rule as central can have their own problems with dehumanizing, and that includes, of course, um, not only uh, uh, certain branches of Islam, but uh, the Christian church in the Middle Ages had uh, a lost sight of this uh, uh, in far too many cases. And we can only hope that uh, Christian churches in general, and the Adventist church in particular, don't lose sight of that. Uh, the, the one concern that I have with this subject is that it is too easy to claim that the conclusions are unacceptable, and therefore the premises must be wrong. Uh, we don't want Darwinian morality, therefore Darwinism is wrong. And stop there, instead of finding out what is wrong with the premises. Because I think if we don't deal with the premises, the conclusion will be uh, attempted to be forced on us again and again and again. And that's one of the reasons that I'm glad that this is question 18, uh, third from the last, instead of question 1 in the book or question 5. I think we first have to deal with, is there a God? Does he care? Uh, did he create us? And then ask what it does for morality afterwards. And with that, that's my take. And uh, those of you who wish to uh, ask questions or make comments are uh, encouraged to do so. We have a hand way in the back there and uh, one here. <coughs> Go ahead. Okay. It seems to me the, um, well, the question of disability or uh, uh, whatever. <laughs> Uh, being that it, it's kind of a relative term, isn't it? I mean, uh, talking about especially the lectures in, in reference to the, uh, the superhuman um, uh, genetic 
uh, morphs of human, you know, genes, and uh, that might put us all in the disabled category, maybe. Um, so, I mean, <laughs> be careful what you um, you vote vote for, maybe. But um, that's one point. Um, well, let me just leave it at that for now. I'll bring up some others later. Okay. Um, comment over here. Uh, I, uh, I appreciate your last comments. Uh, the need for some secure foundation for our ethical behavior. And I think that... Uh, this can be found, strangely, through science. And I would say this uh, because Darwinism does not work scientifically. We wear this in this class, of course. Uh, but uh, it comes back to science has not been able to answer many of our very basic questions. Uh, and uh, as such, uh, does not come to to, to grips with uh, these moral issues and so on that uh, evolution essentially does not provide morality. Uh, it doesn't provide uh, religion uh, per se and so on, which are part of the, the human behavior and which need to be in the equation. Uh, but I, I'd come back to a very simple fact uh, that how did life originate? Uh, how could life, which is so complex, suddenly arise on Earth, an empty Earth, all by itself? Uh, how can complex organs develop? How come the laws of physics are, uh, especially the forces of physics, are so precise? Uh, you get into, in the, how come the fossil record doesn't show continuity, all this? Uh, these issues all get to this basic question of uh, is there a God or isn't there a God? And, and I think uh, we can stay, at least it can be argued, that science itself does provide for an ethical behavior through God, his creation, his word, the Bible, and so on. It's, it's not a blind decision. It's a, it's a logical uh, decision on the basis of scientific data. I would agree with you uh, uh, with one uh Proviso, and that is that it depends on what you're using when you say, or what you mean when you say the word science. Science can be understand, understood in two separate ways. One of them is the body of knowledge that's out there and, uh, and uh, reasonable implications from that knowledge. And the other one is the current scientific consensus. And most people tend to feel that, well, the current scientific consensus is what that body of knowledge should be pointing to. And if you make that connection, uh, then the current scientific consensus is clearly against uh, the intervention of a god. Uh, and so the, if you make that connection, <laughs> then science doesn't point towards god. On the other hand, if you say, what does science really say as opposed to how scientists, or at least some scientists, perhaps the majority of scientists, wish it said. Mm -hmm. I think it is arguable that, in fact, the facts of science, as opposed to how they're interpreted by the standard scientific community, uh, do point towards a god. And of course, once you have a god, mm -hmm. then suddenly you have to ask, well, does he have, you know, is there any kind of owner's manual for running humans? And, uh, and if there is, I think then we have to pay attention to it. Uh, I fully agree with you that uh, it depends on your definition of science here as you use this. Uh, is, and we, we have to ask ourselves the question, is science an atheistic philosophy or is it an open search for truth? And uh, I'm uncomfortable 
or at least I feel that science is less likely to find truth if it uh, restricts its conclusions to, to naturalistic phenomena. On the other hand, if science is an open search for truth, uh, it points definitely to God. And of course, if there's a God, we'd have some word from him. The Bible would be that word. And that word provides us the morality that uh, we tend to lose sight of when we exclude God from the picture. I would agree with that. Uh, we have another comment so, uh, back in the back. Um, it seems like the euthanasia question is uh, based on, um, you know, society being burdened with, with costs or um, mostly, I guess, primarily cost-wise. Is it? I mean, if I'm getting that correctly. Um, uh, so, I mean, if if they're going to say, are these people useful, you know, then you get in a definition of usefulness, which yes, becomes yeah. very dangerous. I mean, because you could think of a lot of people that are fairly useless, maybe, but, uh, you know, is everyone going to be euthanized, like criminals or mm -hmm. other things? Uh, well, essentially, of course, euthanizing criminals is uh, known as the death penalty. Right, exactly. That's what I was just going to comment. <laughs> uh, but, of course, it's not done to all criminals. You have to kind of earn it in that sense. But. Uh, Paul, you, yes. you, you, you made that comment about India, and I kind of miss what were the full implications of what was happening in India. Oh, in India, 98% uh, or so of the uh, yeah. aborted fetuses are female. <clears throat> Now, it's a little difficult to imagine that all of the genetic defects in India are on females. So you have to start asking questions about maybe there's, um, um, shall we call it selection bias that, uh, that is happening here. And it's very interesting to watch feminists squirm when this point is, uh, fact is pointed out because, uh, you know, Abortion on demand, at least in certain s segments of feminism, is kind of a sacred cow, uh, <coughs> pardon the expression, uh, in this setting. But, uh, uh, but the idea that all of the worthless people are, are, or 98% of them, are, are female uh, bothers feminists to no end. And it's really abortion on demand uh, doesn't leave you any, any way of combating that. I will point out also that this, even this ethic is not good enough for modern political correctness. And the reason why is very simple. You notice that the worth of a human being is dependent upon their mental abilities um, that's, well, that's not quite true because when we go to sleep at night, we don't have any mental abilities to speak of. That we're less sentient at that point than uh, uh, an awake chimpanzee or for that matter, an awake rat. And so you can't say, well, it's okay to kill people as long as you do it in their sleep. I mean, <laughs> that just doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and that means that we have to allow for potential abilities. And I don't think it'll work very well to say, well, you can kill three-year-olds because their mental abilities are only as good as a really good trained chimpanzee. Uh, for one thing, that's not true for some three-year-olds, but for another thing, um, even, uh, I mean, you know, at a certain point, there are attachments that, uh, uh, that make it uh, really hard to say that. And, and I th if you say, well, it's because of their potential mental abilities, well then, all fetuses that don't have obvious 
genetic defects or something like that. I mean, I'll grant you that, you know, trisomy 23, let's say, not uh, Down syndrome won't work really, um, but um, there are some other trisomies that can give you in, get you into trouble that that are worse off than Down syndrome on and on the average. Um, you could say that person uh, will never amount to much more than uh, a well-trained dog, maybe less, if you're trying to be critical. But the abortion on demand takes fetuses that could turn into geniuses. In fact, um, right now, those of you who are following football may know about a quarterback who rather shocked the league this year by doing extremely well. Um, and he also shocked the league by praying uh, in public. Uh, his name is Tom, uh, Tim Tebow. And uh, his mother considered aborting him and decided not to, even though it represented a significant risk to her health. Um, and abortion on demand, there's no reason not to. As we can see, obviously, this person uh, qualifies as not only human, but probably exceptionally human. Um, and so if you count future possibilities, you have to say, no, abortion on demand simply will not work without having some particular reason. And because the because mother doesn't want him really isn't a good enough reason. And especially because mother's boyfriend doesn't want him isn't a good enough reason. Um, and so even if you're following Darwinian ethics, you don't get to where we are in modern society. Uh, what it looks like is basically once you turn off the outside uh, that people basically do what they want to do. And ethics kind of, we try our best to, to maintain something, but it disappears. Uh, there's another interesting point in this regard, and uh, Peter Singer, who has mentioned, um, said pretty loudly that, uh, you know, once people get old and senile, I, you know, you really shouldn't uh, be wasting lots of resources trying to take care of them. Um, Peter Singer's mother became old and senile, and he took care of her, uh, which is, of course, a failure of Peter Singer's ethics. But in my opinion, a success of Peter Singer, the moral person in spite of his ethics. Uh, yes, again, another yeah. question. It seems like there's four, there's four area, uh, well, groups of people that are most costly to society. One is the preemies. Preemies can cost, what, a million dollars pretty much fairly easily yeah. uh, to take care of them. That's a lot of that, I believe, is preventable. So, in, you know, that's something that they, they could do um, to work more on the preventative side. The second area is criminals. And uh, that is also, for the most part, preventable. We already know what causes most of the criminal behavior. I mean, 90%. You know, now, um, that, that may be a stretch right now, but that's, I think, because of our primitive status, our society. Now, a few hundred years from now, I don't think they'll look at that, that, that the way that we may look at that now as a big problem, big hurdle. But um, the other area is people's health that basically don't take care of them, themselves. Uh, you know, they're eating junk food all the time. They're, they're not, you know, eating their nine fruits and vegetables, which most of us don't do, but, you know, some of us can get away with that more than others. But, and then, like you mentioned already, the elderly, um, extremely expensive. I mean, they can be costing taxpayers $6,000 a month just to take care of them easily. Uh, so, but I think the main problem is really that Who's going to make a decision about whether somebody lives or dies? I don't think our, you could say ethics, but also our understanding of how do we just decide what is valuable yeah. 
like you said, there's a lot of problems we already can see. Before uh, I comment on that, I will point out that it's, uh, uh, well, it's actually we have until 11.30 because that's when uh, uh, I think the church starts at 11.45. So we have probably about 20 minutes to, to uh, for further discussion. Um, we have a couple of hands over here. Maybe we can send the mic over. <coughs> Uh, Mickey and uh, could you elaborate on uh, what you were referring to about nice and the arthritis medicine um, it was one of the more recently developed medicines and it had been patented and uh, uh, there was a lot of research cost that the company was recovering at that point and so they they had the price of the medicine up, and uh, uh, I said, "Well, it's a nice, it's a good medicine, but where uh, if we allow it to all arthritis sufferers, why uh, we'll bust our budget, and so therefore we won't allow it." Now, in a model where uh, people are supposed to pay for their own medicine. You could say, well, you know, if you want it bad enough, then you pay for it. Um, and in, in America, one of the things that will happen often is in that situation is that the company will make it uh, available for a cheaper price for uh, people who qualify in certain ways. If you like, we're kind of practicing socialized medicine on the fly uh, by voluntary uh, efforts. Uh, but. Uh, uh, when the National Health Service says they won't pay for it, uh, in Great Britain nobody budgets enough for uh, medicine other than what the, what the National Health Service uh, pays for. And so getting your own medicine is going to be prohibitively expensive for the vast majority of people. So what you wind up with in that, in that situation is, uh, is uh, uh, the government basically denying it to the uh, entire population except for those who are rich enough to afford it. Ed. As you're aware, a large segment of the human population believes differently than we do. One of my wife's students said if she screwed up, she might return as an ant. Well, if you're going to return as some kind of animal, Perhaps uh, equality with human beings can be understood. Another one, another religion, has a preponderance of belief in fate. Whatever happens, happens. Why should a, uh, a naturalist scientist intercede in a tubal pregnancy, for instance, and save the mother's life? It's her fate that she would die, you know. Uh, well, actually, it's not her fate that she should die. It's her fate that she should go to a hospital and somebody will take care of it because they were fated to do it too. <laughs> the problem with using fate is that you can't make a coherent argument as to, to uh, how human choices should be guided. So I'm wondering how Darwinism affects these great religions besides Christianity. Um, I guess, I guess the thing that bothers me about that whole thing is that uh, Darwinism seems to give a certain kind of justification for um, ignoring the weak, uh, certainly not allowing them to propagate. And, uh, you know, the, the Planned Parenthood movement, the eugenics movement to begin with, which is another bad word in Germany for obvious reasons. Um, was an attempt to try to get this um, uh, you know people who are not very bright and who are bringing up children who are not very bright well they just shouldn't have as many children mm -hmm. so we need to do something to stop that and you start by sterilizing and if that doesn't work well enough then you uh, move on to uh, putting them to sleep, which is uh, what was happening in Nazi Germany in the early uh, 1930s, or late 1930s when they 
had enough control to do that. I wanted to make two points. One is that Margaret Sanger and Peter Singer have both done a number on Western thought and morality that has, is being devastating, I think. The second point is that in countries where girls are euthanized or aborted, we're having larger and larger populations of men. Right now, the impact of that is that a lot of men are going to other countries marrying women that don't even speak the same language, but that are poor, and but they need a husband and the, the husbands need a woman. Um, and it, some of my students are telling me that in their countries that they're beginning to see extreme negative happenings based on this kind of um, kill the boy, I mean kill the girl, and have lots of boys left. It seems to me that at some point in the fairly near future with the large countries that are killing off girl babies, we're going to have so many men that they're going to have to go to war. Uh, it's an interesting comment, uh, and it's particularly interesting in uh, India is one place, of course, where the abortions are taking place, but they're all voluntary in one sense. In China, each family is allowed one child because they're trying to reduce population. Well, of course, uh, if you're going to do that, then you have to figure out some way of keeping the fertility rate down, and the, one of the easiest ways to do that is having abortions. And uh, so... Uh, Chinese families are deciding, well, they want a male line. So uh, the females are getting aborted there, too, uh, disproportionately. And uh, there's a lot of um, uh, only children males in China right now. And it's, uh, there's some very interesting things happening in terms of the, uh, in terms of the society. And, you know, only children tend to be spoiled. And and so you have a you have a nation of spoiled children, um, and uh, so it's it's turning into a very interesting situation. And uh, I, I don't know where it's going to go, but I it's not one that brings warm feelings to my heart when I think about it. Al and I went to the San Bernardino County Medical Museum this week, and there was a picture of a Chinese woman and her son, who was about three or four years old. He was surrounded by fruit and flowers and butterflies and art and musical instruments and obviously living the good life. And she had this large smile on her face. She was obviously very happy. This was a propaganda picture from the 30s, I believe, uh, to enforce the child, one child per family that, that was, you know, widely circulated in China. So is, are we saying that evolutionists don't have a moral code? Or if they do, that they're being inconsistent then with the evolutionary mm -hmm. theory? Well, the bioethicists who are doing strict logic chopping um, come up with a moral code eventually, and it's value the individual for what the individual can do. So I suppose if you're a great quarterback and you break your throwing arm, you're done. Because after all, you're not much worth after that. No, you can have worth in other areas. Well, you hope so. You hope so. <coughs> maybe, uh, maybe you can turn to become a nuclear physicist or something. Um, of course, you'll be starting uh, competing with people who are relatively fresher at being in school at that point. Uh, but that leads to a whole bunch of problems, and one of them is uh, everybody eventually gets too old to do something. You know, in sports at 40, you're washed up pretty much. In coaching, maybe you'll go on to 80. So unless you unless can argue you that their stories and their experiences can still be passed on. And so yes, then they would still have value. Well, <clears throat> I'm most curious about, <clears throat> so the species, you know, is, 
So I'm curious if they're vegetarian. A, um, many of them urge us to be vegetarian. I get emails from a group that somehow got a hold of my name and uh, uh, keeps sending me this stuff about, uh, and, and that's actually their entree into the whole thing. And uh, uh, in fact, I think I met them at um, at APC because they thought, oh, these are a bunch of vegetarians. Why we can, you know, pull them into our fold? And of course, uh, advocating vegetarianism is no problem with me at all. Uh, but uh, uh, but it is very interesting that uh, that uh, they start out with stuff like that, and then pretty soon you begin to realize that they're really uh, you know they can't stand any kind of medical research that might uh, impact animals in any way. Uh, never mind whether the animals are treated properly or not otherwise. But but this uh, is strictly from an evolutionary thinking or do they even think of it in those kinds of terms? Uh, they, they do. <coughs> so if, so if a, a certain species has evolved beyond other species, then wouldn't there be a relative uh, value there that it would, then it would be <coughs> useful to preserve the more evolved species over the, another? Well, you see, their, their argument is that, yeah, you, you've evolved beyond other people, but this kid with Down syndrome, why well, he's no better than a chimpanzee. And if you're going to treat him in certain ways, then you've got to treat the chimpanzees that way. And if you're not going to treat the chimpanzees that way, then you don't have any right to treat him that way. And through a little curious uh, subterfuge, you wind up with them saying, well, you've got to treat the chimpanzees as they have human rights. There are, I mean, there are people who are actually trying to make chimpanzees citizens and things like that. Um, but the, the humans know because they're not bright enough. They shouldn't have. It's interesting that if we're no better, we're the only ones that can make the decision <coughs> to treat them as no different. Well, you know, there's a fundamental problem here that isn't often addressed. And it's, it's usually just simply assumed, and that is, if our rights don't come from a creator who made us for purposes and expects certain things out of us, where do they come from? And the answer that's always given is our own human decency. And the problem is that human decency is malleable. Um, you can get entire nations to become indecent to each other, if you like. We've seen it happen in modern times, and it certainly did happen in ancient times. You know, some of the practices in the ancient Greek city-states, you really wouldn't want. Infanticide. But they were accepted by a whole civilization. So if you're going to appeal to human decency, and you're not going to say that some human decency is better than others, and you have a standard by which you can make that claim, uh, then you really don't have a, a basis for morality at all. It's you do what you want to do. Uh, you don't like killing babies, that's fine. You don't have to kill them. Uh, but if somebody else does, why well, you have no, no business interfering. If you become the majority and a strong enough majority to where you can make it stick, then yeah, you can stop them from killing little babies. But it's strictly a societal thing and it has nothing to do with morality itself. It just has to do with your own personal yuck factor. And there are people who are trying to make the case that all of morality is simply an expression, uh, a refined expression of the yuck factor. We have one over here. What do they say in society when we have the increase in autism and they have a lot of brains? but they're having a hard time functioning. What did they say about that? Well, that's an interesting question all the way around. Um, 
there's a guy in uh, right now at uh, Oxford, I believe, who is in a wheelchair, who has to be fed, clothed, changed, diapered, whatever. And he's the considered one of the most brilliant physicists on Earth. Um, Stephen Hawking. Uh, is his value the fact that he can't do anything? Or is his value that he can think? Um, and it, it reveals a, a, a really a, a problem with this kind of, you know, how do you, uh, how do you value people? Um, if you value humans because they're human, I think you're probably on safer ground. And especially so, if there really was a God who really did design humans and who really did put them at the apex of his creation. I'm going to make one other case in morality, and, and this is maybe a little bit of a surprise, but uh, I think that the problem with murder is more with the person who murders than the person who gets murdered. We all die. None of us knows when we're going to die. Um, I, if it comes earlier to some than others, um, we have to kind of be prepared for that. But if somebody does it deliberately, there have to be one of two reactions to it. One of them is that you become devastated. And interestingly enough, policemen who shoot criminals in the act of committing crimes are nowadays given a period of time off where they can talk to somebody and kind of allow uh, some healing to, become, uh, to, uh, to happen because if they don't, they're not that much good for the next few weeks and they don't recover as well. And that's for people who did what they were trained to do, what they're, uh, uh, at least according to society's rules, justified in doing. Um, on the other hand, uh, it isn't nearly as hard on somebody if it happens accidentally. And if it happened accidentally and you didn't even know about it, you would be going about your daily life as if nothing had happened. Um, it's, it's the knowledge that you're responsible for somebody's death and the knowledge that you did it deliberately that really uh, is hard on people. Uh, you may have heard of battle-hardened uh, uh, armies. What that means is that the people who aren't actually shooting other people have either dropped out or died or, uh, or, or have been converted into people who can. A uh, little known fact is that um, a substantial proportion of new recruits who are put in battle actually winding up shooting over the heads of the enemy, deliberately missing them, or semi-deliberately missing them. And it's the battle-hardened ones that go right for the uh, chest and, and take them down. And that's why an army that hasn't been tested in battle actually doesn't do as well. But when you do that, there's a part of yourself that has to be kind of steeled. And, you know, it reminds you of the conscience that's seared with a hot iron. I'm not sure that's good for people in general. It's arguable as to whether eventually you have to get to that point. But certainly, the process itself is not good for somebody. So do we have an obligation for those that are coming home from Iraq and Afghanistan and have battle scars? and they're useless and they're not able to do anything just as in Vietnam, so we have no obligation to take care of them. 
Um, well, you see, from a Christian perspective, no, they require care just as much as anybody else. And perhaps because of their battle scars, they require more because they, they need it. See, but, but that's... If you, uh, if you, if you follow if, that if philosophy... If you follow this logic, no, you're right. Uh, why, you know, when people become useless enough, why you just um, put them to sleep or certainly you don't mm -hmm. spend lots of money working on them. Okay. And uh, we have a couple of comments up here. Uh, <coughs> Real, just real quick, uh, I saw a special on Hitler on, on Nova or something a few weeks ago, and he actually said that that he, he you know, we think of Hitler is so bad and everything in his arm and the SS and all this, but he actually instructed his generals in his to you know in his army to ignore your morals. That's what we have to do to win. I mean, so he was aware of that uh, problem, you could say. Yeah. Well, I should, before we get our next comment, pause and note that it is now 1130, and I know some of you have to be elsewhere. Uh, but uh, for those of you who want to stay and discuss a little more, we'll continue the conversation for a little bit. Yes. I notice, just based on the footnotes of the sources that are esteemed author is uh, quoting that many, most of the quotes are from agnostic or atheistic uh, Darwinists. I wonder if he would write the chapter differently if he was addressing only those who believe in theistic evolution. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is there seems to be a little flaw in his logic, and the flaw is if you accept Darwinism, you automatically uh, believe in abortion and have no guidelines abortion you open it up wide to abort in any situation uh, Roman Catholics are very anti-abortion are they not yet they are. with the Pope's blessing Roman Catholics can accept any form of theistic evolution as long as the soul gets put in man at some point and you have to that's the key you have to divide between soul and body. And so the soul is created at the moment of conception. That's an act of creation, an act of God, and you're not to interfere with that. So their form of Darwinism um, allows for accepting, you know, any type of Darwinism, Darwinism as long as they can have the creation of the soul there at conception. Now, my question for you, I haven't thought this through very much. If you were rewriting this chapter and addressing just those who are like Roman Catholics or even conservative evangelicals, many of whom are theistic evolutionists, at least they believe in long ages, how would we write that chapter differently? That's, I know that we could spend a lot of time on that, but if you were writing it, how, how would you do it differently than what Earl has done? No, actually, that's a very good question. Um, <clears throat> it's a question for myself, And that's too, one of the reasons that I through. said in the, at the very beginning, I said Darwinism and naturalism, because, of course, the, the, the Pope is, in, is essentially insisting that at some point naturalism has to stop. And what he's done is he said, well, it's, it's when Adam got a soul. Now, uh, Here's the problem. If you say we have to accept science and you don't differentiate between the current scientific consensus and the, the actual data and theory of science, then you are going to accept everything except the soul that does not have any material impact whatsoever. Um, except that that soul does have a material impact in that we build churches, we do all kinds of things um, that the church would say is in fact 
the response to what God has to say to our souls, whereas the Darwinists would insist that um, that is simply a naturalistic outgrowth of, of what humans had to do to survive. And one of the things they had to do to survive was become religious. So, yeah, we can be religious, but it doesn't really mean anything. In, in, it's just one of those cultural things that we do. And, uh, and so what the church has tried to do is to avoid conflict. It's really been doing that ever since it got burned by Galileo. It got burned really, really badly by Galileo, and it's putting Copernicus's book on the uh, no-read list, the index, I think is what they call it. And, um, and they, they basically had to eat their words. And they finally done so, officially. But they kind of did it unofficially for so long that everybody knew, including them, that that was a mistake. And because of that, when any other challenge from science came out that had the blessing of the scientific community, they didn't feel a able to challenge it from a religious standpoint. And as long as you're going to do that, you'll eventually have to back off in the soul as well. If you're going to insist that there's some part of us that can contact a God that's out there, then you have to go against Darwinist science because Darwinist science cannot tolerate that. So you're saying they're inconsistent in accepting Darwinism yet advocating the uh, divine creation of the soul. That's right. If they were really smart at it, I think they would go with intelligent design. Which many of them do. Which I think, frankly, eventually they'll wind up doing. Now that gets to a whole, a whole uh, different uh, point, and that is that one of the problems with, that we're fighting is the perception that whenever science and religion have a conflict, science always wins and religion always loses. And in fact, I wrote an editorial for Origins a while back um, asking, does religion always lose? And basically, I took up that specific question and I think answered it with a no. And I think that if you're in a religious tradition that can do that, you have a far more cogent and powerful answer to the kinds of arguments that I've just outlined here on, you know, what about, is there anything transcendent about us? So your message to our theistic evolutionist friends would be, look, your position is totally incompatible with your theology and your defense of, of you know, the unborn child. Uh, your theology doesn't match up with... Um, you know, I applaud 99.9, maybe close to 100% of what they have to say about abortion. I just, I, I can't, uh, I can't applaud how they got there because I don't think that it's consistent enough to meet the challenge. Thank you. Um, we have a comment over here. <coughs> Whoops. I wanted to go back to your battle harden. Um, comment you were talking about. I, I think it had something to do with the yuck factor, right? As far as the bat, battle-hardened people being able to shoot over the head or, or well, shoot the, at the, 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 the battle-hardened people shoot at the person rather than shooting over right, their head. Right, right, right. Yeah. I and uh, unfortunately, I don't remember the statistics, and I'm very uncomfortable just making them up because... 65.3% uh, of, uh, of all statistics are made up on the spot. Uh, 
<laughs> anyway, I, that made me think about. But it's it's, it's either one quarter or three quarters of the of the standard army when it first goes into battle will mm. not shoot at the enemy. Yeah, well, it's a substantial portion. I was thinking about this experience I had with some kids. I think it was Pathfinders or something. And, and um, there was a spider running across the floor. And I told this girl, step on him quick. She wouldn't do it because she felt sorry for the spider. You know? So um, I was thinking, you know, well, when, when God had Adam kill the first lamb, I'm sure he didn't like to do it either. So it's almost like that yuck factor isn't reliable either. Uh, and, and I agree with that. I agree with that, that, uh, that trying to make morality out of a yuck factor that leads to some rather inconsistent morality. Coming down here. Uh, regarding, regarding Dr. Sanford's visit, is it the 4th or the 11th? Uh, I got well, caught on that. The bulletin says the 4th, and it's probably wrong. I think that's wrong, because I have scheduling for the following. Yes, no, no. in fact, and, and I know you're right, because it is the 8th uh, that he's scheduled to see, speak some other places or something like that's that. That's right. It, it is the 11th. Yes. And it is my fault, and, uh, well, I'll do my best to correct it now, and... What? Uh, we will be here next week. It's the week after. A um, couple more questions. Um, I think I've been reading in the newspapers that uh, that statistic about the, the, the soldiers is actually an, an older statistic from like World War II and uh, maybe Korea and maybe even somewhat up into Vietnam, but that the Marines, I, I was reading about the training and stuff in, in the newspaper, and that the Marines and the Army have learned from that, and that the soldiers they're putting out nowadays, that doesn't hold true. The guys are much more deadly. They uh, basically, they figured out a way to train them to, uh, to get over much that. shoot and kill, and that's it. Yeah. Uh, you that's know, is part that, of it, but... Uh, it's, yeah, and, and, and any army worth its salt uh, who has that goal in mind, you know, has to take that into account. And uh, they, you still probably have battle-hardened people, oh, but yeah. they're just okay. more hardened than they used to be. And they start out, they start out at a higher uh, lethality range. Um, uh, you know, it's interesting. I don't know if you guys read this, this sharpshooter that uh, killed uh, 137 people or something like that and earned the name of Shaitan el Baluj. Uh, or something like that, basically the devil of, uh, of Fallujah. Uh, or maybe it was Ramad. It was one of those two. Anyway, he, he, was, in the, he was in one of those battles and, and uh, just picking people off all the time. The first person that he picked off was a woman who was carrying a grenade and trying to throw it at some soldiers. And as she dropped a grenade. He hesitated. His uh, commander said, no, you've got to shoot at her. And he did, and he said after that he didn't hesitate. And so, I mean, you can see that this is one of the things that happens when you kill people, even when you feel it's justified. Um, and if, you, if you're doing it when you don't feel it's justified, what usually happens is you make up reasons in your mind why it must have been justified. And so that it's easier to, to kill anybody that gets in your way because, after all, they're in your way. And I, I think this is a really an important, uh, important point uh, that, that killing, the thing that's hard is not that the baby dies, it's that the, that the doctors and nurses and care people know in their hearts that they didn't really try to help, that they actually tried to make it worse. And it's one of the reasons why in medicine, passive euthanasia is allowed, uh, but active is not. Because it's one thing to sit there and say, uh, you know, the baby is suffering, but there's no, really nothing we can do about it, and so the, the, the attempt isn't worth doing anything because it's not going to change the outcome. And you feel bad about it. But 
you know, if you actually put the hand over it and suffocate the mouth, you are now, you've done something active and, and it's, it's changed how you approach things. There's one other thing that's interesting, is fascinating in terms of medicine and this whole, uh, I don't know if you, most of you know this, but the Hippocratic Oath, the one the doctors used to always have to take, specifically forbade abortion. And in fact, it's very interesting. If you look at what you swear on the, on the oath, it starts out with all the gods and goddesses, which of course we are now put into one god, but that's pretty easy to a, a transition to make. You swear, one, to take care of your own. That is, the members of your profession you'll take care of. Okay. Two, that you will not kill anybody. Uh, it was a distinction between physicians and pharmacists who, you know, could sell you whatever drug you wanted. Now, fortunately, pharmacy has come a long way since then. Uh, but, uh, in fact, if you l read the list of the people who get into the lake of fire, one of them is pharmacists. <laughs> And the reason why is because the pharmacist, you know, you want some strychnine so you can kill your neighbor. You go down to your friendly pharmacist and you buy strychnine and, uh, you know, it's, hey, it's whatever you want to do with it. Sounds fine with me, you know. And, um, uh, uh, no, uh, no, but it is in the Greek, pharmakoi. I think it's sorcerers is, uh, is how it got translated. And, uh, but you know, these are the people who do magic spells and conjunctions and magic potions. And one of the magic potions is, you know, uh, a death potion to somebody else. And, and, um, and the, other thing that, the other thing that physicians promise not to do is to have sex with their patients. Even the slaves. Now, Think about that a little bit. What it, what, it is, what it is trying to say is when you go to your doctor's office, you will be in a safe place. You don't have to worry about somebody killing you, somebody sexually violating you, uh, that, that, that once you walk in, they're not going to harm you. And that was the basis of medicine. And we've sometimes lost sight of that. And I think that when physicians are put in position, you don't need a doctor's license to give somebody a poison. You know, whether or not you want to argue that, uh, that people should be allowed to commit suicide and other people should be allowed to help them, there's no reason to involve physicians in that decision. Uh, but physicians, kind of take upon themselves the, the aspect of God. They, they do all of the really important decisions and therefore they should be able to uh, harm people as well if the people want to be harmed. And I just, philosophically, there's a problem with that. Uh, we have a couple of other comments. <coughs> um, well, as far as this recent uh, comment, um, well, usually the the physician is actually considering helping the patient. Say, for an example, if they're in excruciating pain and there's nothing medications can do for them, and you know they just you know want to end it. I, although I think what's missing in my book is uh, possible. Uh, you know, solutions to their health problems or cures or whatever you want to call it um, that is outside of the box, so to speak, of the physician. But the Hippocratical Oath is, I, I feel very uh, hypocritical, really, because everything the doctor does virtually is harmful. He's always given them poison, in a sense. It's, that's what we call side effects. It's a nice way of saying poison. Yeah. You know. I mean, that's the reality. That's the truth. But uh, it, it's but with they the don't intention of think. doing more good than harm. <laughs> well, yeah. So it's always what's the trade-off is how they're looking at it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 
But 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 the point is the point is that you walk into the doctor's office. The doctor's job is to help you, right? Yeah, uh, no, I understand. And that. and, uh, and doesn't always help you to it. die was not part of the bargain, and yeah. in my book, shouldn't be. But on the same point, there's no guarantee that he's going to help you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it still does happen. They have sex with their patients, and uh, you see it yes, on the news. Yes, but um, but I will say this. But it's good that there's if they do. Yeah. They, they, it's one of the They're ways out, yeah. you can lose your license. And, oh, yeah. yeah. And, and I think that part of it is still there. Yeah. Although there are people who are trying to blur that uh, border as well, but I think that it's proving harder to blur that border than the other one. Yeah. Anyway, uh, back to the other subject. I, as far as I just was going to make a couple com comments here, the, uh, the value of like people. Um, if you look back in history, many many artists and geniuses of one sort or another were not valued in their time and yet later we value them greatly uh, so it, it's like I said before <coughs> it's, it's mostly man's flawed thinking process that that just is not good at deciding these things in general um, some degree they they may be able to uh, I don't I don't think I can't say that they might never be able to and there's certain circumstances, like, for an example, the one I just brought up about people being excruciating pain, they just want to check out, maybe. But I think all other options should be considered, not just what medical science says. Because, again, it's, it's, it's another very flawed science at this, at this present day situation. It doesn't include many things that are constantly being over, overridden as, as time goes on. So... Um, the other thing, the main thing that I object to in this present time as far as supporting, um, I, I knew a person, a friend of, friend of mine's mom that she had diabetes and then uh, she was, she, I mean she had a deplorable diet. I mean she was eating like one of these large tubs of margarine like a week or something like that. You know, just eat whatever the heck you want. <laughs> Um, and uh, at the time, uh, her daughter was thinking of uh, giving her a kidney, you know, to, to save her life, right? Uh -huh. But uh, luckily that didn't happen. I, I suggested don't, don't do that because, you know, it's, you're going you're gonna to pay for that and yes. she's going to still kill herself. And, um, and diet... Frankly, especially in people who are overweight, is the cornerstone of treating diabetes. Diabetes type two. Um, diet. Uh, there's a guy in um, Riverside that I trained under, who said anybody who actually follows the diet carefully enough can do it on diet alone if they're yeah. type two diabetic, yeah. and he's pretty close to proving his point. Uh, now you know type yeah. one, you're stuck because you just don't have insulin, and no, no diet's going to fix that one. But type 2, uh, I agree wholeheartedly. And I think that's actually one of the advantages of having an institution like this where we can both recognize the things that medicine you're stuck with, you're dependent on, um, and the things where, in fact, other, uh, other than uh, drugs, there are a lot of things that uh, can be done better and... Uh, and uh, I think that uh, in that case, we're, we do very well to emphasize diet, exercise, and then maybe if you're not quite pulling it together at that point, try to help out a little bit with medicine, but always recognizing that the, uh, that the best thing is the diet and exercise. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, would, I would never uh, caution and never say never because too many times the, the powers that be have been proven wrong. Yeah. And uh, even with type 1 diabetes, I've heard of people treating it today. Uh, but, you know, it, it, once you get the pancreas started, you're, you're out of type 1 already. So, yeah. Uh, Question. You know, yeah. How many people who are overweight get diabetes? What, what percentage? I, I, you know, I, I Actually, there's a chart I, I right downstairs, right downstairs at the bottom of the stairs. I was just looking at it on the, on the way up. What does it say? Well, um, what was interesting about the statistics was 
uh, Hispanics, well, uh, Hispanics and, and blacks are high, I think they were equal with the diabetic part. The whites were actually lower as far as the um, uh, killing them. But I think that's because they're getting treatments, perhaps. Um, but anyway, you can look at the chart down there. But yeah, but in terms of incidents, I don't know. I don't know in, actual, in terms of actual numbers. I can tell you that uh, in my practice that I see, I see an awful lot of diabetics. Uh, and uh, I, would s I would say the people that I see, probably half or more of the people who overweight wind up with diabetes sooner or later. But I, I uh, that's th that is a, that's one of those uh, statistics that I told you about, so. I had heard a figure of 80%. Yeah, one doctor told uh, me eventually you might everybody be right. gets diabetes if they it, live it, long enough. But yeah, I, it might even you know, be 100% if you wait long enough. I, but I don't believe that. Instead but it, I, there's some people who are resistant to it and, uh, you know, get 600, 800 pounds and still their blood sugar is okay. Uh, I don't know how they do it. And Most uh, of it's diet related. And uh, sure. yeah. but people with diabetes can often get over their diabetes if they lose the weight. Another thing I wanted to say is... Um, going back to the soul being put in the Catholic body <laughs> yeah. at conception. Um, if you read the book Total Truth by Nancy Piercy, yes. um, she's not a rabid evangelical saying, I have the total truth. Uh, she is talking about, she's a historian from Stanford, goes around to the different universities and um, very reputable, very scholarly. I, I've read her book, and I highly approve of it. And for what it's, uh, although uh, it's probably good for you to describe it, because not everybody here has, I'm sure. Yeah, it it um, she shows when and how the divide happened between soul and body historically in the the religion and science, where. Uh, religion got split off from science in order to justify naturalistic science. And religion was just up there, oh, well, that's nice, you know, you can have that, but it doesn't have any effect on science, which is the truth. And she says, no, the total truth includes religion. Uh, it, is, it is a problem when you, uh, when you try to avoid the question by... Uh, by dividing things up into watertight compartments, you find out they're not as watertight as you thought. And they keep interfering with each other. And so you're either going to have to have some kind of a, a truce or some kind of a um, integration, or you're going to constantly be fighting this battle of where is the borderline between science and religion. Yeah, I, I In my view, it needs to be integrated, which is why I wrote the book called Scientific Theology. Right. Exactly. Um, get a, a mic over here. I think I've got a partial answer to your question. Um, I believe it's well, that doesn't seem right. I think I read that 32% of the U.S. population is obese, uh, although that might be overweight plus. No, no, it is obese. Um, so 30 uh, or 32 or 33%, I think it's 32%, uh, and then 8.3% of the U.S. population is, uh, uh, has diabetes of one type or another. Uh, so that comes to 25%. It's got to be s uh, somewhat lower than that. Uh, of obese that have obesity because you got to take into account type um, type one type one and also not <coughs> I saw the other percent I'd have to uh, add it as well but not all uh, diabetics are obese as well so it's probably going to be 22 percent is my guess of of obese uh, have diabetes by the way this comes back to another point that was raised earlier by someone and that is uh, um, all of these things can be prevented sometimes. Well, not all of them, but a, a substantial number of them. Um, people who are diabetic in their end stage will, you know, be blind, be uh, uh, maybe have strokes. Uh, you know, the kind of people that one might say, well, you know, they're nearly not much better than a, 
vegetable. Why don't we just um, turn and pull the plug on him? And um, I would argue that one of the advantages of keeping those people going is that it forces us to ask ourselves, is there something else that we could do to prevent this from happening? Whereas if all you do is just turn them off, well, the, then they're, they're no drain on society, so nobody asks, well, what can we do to prevent this from happening? So there are practical reasons as well as theological ones for not wanting to uh, uh, dispose of the problem quite so easily. You also mentioned that the hardening factor, the battle hardened, that if I say I want to die, if, I, if my life isn't useful to me, then I put the burden on my husband to become hardened, to know he killed his wife at her request, but still it would, it would tend to blunt his conscience. Yeah, well what happens is that let's supposing that he lives on and then he marries again and the next wife, it'll be a little easier for him to say. Yeah. I will never marry anybody beside my wife. <laughs> well, that's... <laughs> Uh, Glad to hear it. Uh, this is probably a good time to, to close up shop. <laughs>